Welcome to this presentation on spinal anesthesia. A spinal anesthesia is a regional technique of administering anesthesia that involves injecting a small amount of local anesthetic drugs into the cerebrospinal fluid. The injection is usually made in the lumbar spine below the level at which the spinal cord ends, that is usually at, at the second lumbar vertebra. This ensures safety and effectiveness of the anesthesia. It is primarily used for surgeries below the umbilicus, for example the lower abdominal surgeries, pelvic surgeries, perineal and lower limb operations. A spinal anesthesia provides excellent muscle relaxation and a high patient satisfaction. Spinal anesthesia offers several advantages as it is cost effective and requires minimal equipment. It preserves airway patency and causes a minimal respiratory depression. Additionally, it reduces intraoperative blood losses and improves postoperative recovery. These are the key benefits in both elective and emergency procedures. However, spinal anesthesia is not without its limitations and there is a steep learning curve for beginners. There is also a risk of a failed block and inadequate anesthesia and common complications include hypotension, a postdural puncture headache or infection if aseptic techniques are not followed during administration. Spinal anesthesia is particularly suitable for surgeries below the umbilicus. It's ideal for elderly patients or those with significant comorbidities. Common applications include obstetric surgeries, especially caesarean section, gynecological surgeries, urological and trauma surgeries which involve the lower body. Absolute contraindications include a patient refusal, infection at the puncture site, and a coagulation disorder. Some of the relative contraindications, some of the relative contraindications are a raised intracranial pressure, sepsis, hypovolemia, uncooperative behavior, anatomical spine deformities, or some certain neurological diseases. When looking at the anatomy of the spine, in adults, the spinal cord ends at the second lumbar vertebral level, and in children, it ends at the L3 level. To avoid a cord injury, a dural puncture is always performed below these levels, typically between the third and fourth lumbar vertebra, or the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebra. The needle must pass through several layers, starting from the skin, the subcutaneous tissues, the ligamentum flavum, the dura mater and into the subarachnoid space where the drug is administered. Looking at the physiology of the spinal anesthesia, local anesthetic solution is injected into the subarachnoid space below the end of the spinal cord which blocks the conduction of nerve impulses along the nerves in which the drug comes into contact with. Although some nerves are easily blocked than others, there are essentially three classes of nerves, the motor nerves, sensory and autonomic nerves. The motor nerves are known to convey messages for the muscles to contract and when they are blocked, muscle paralysis results. On the other hand, sensory nerves transmit sensations, for example touch and pain to the spinal cord and from the spinal cord to the brain. Lastly, the autonomic nerves control the caliber of the blood vessels, the heart rate, gut contraction and other functions which are essentially not under conscious control. In spinal anesthesia, smaller autonomic and pain fibers are blocked first and then larger motor fibers are blocked last. Vasodilation and a drop in blood pressure may occur early when the autonomic fibers are blocked. As the motor fibers are blocked last if the patient can't lift their legs, the spinal is considered successful. Although this gives no any indication of the block height and during surgery, the patient may be aware of touch and yet they have no any feeling of sensation of pain when surgery starts. What are the needles that we use in spinal anesthesia? Spinal needles can be either cutting or blunt tipped and they're usually nine centimeters long. The original Quinco needle is an example of a cutting needle that is used in the spinal anesthesia with the opening at the end of the needle. As more recent develops have occurred, 
Blunt tip needles decrease the incidence of post puncture headaches compared to the cutting needles, as this happens because they separate the fibers of the dura mater rather than cutting through these fibers, therefore reducing the chances of a post puncture. The two other needles beside the quink needle is Whitaker and Sprout needles, which have a round tip with a side port. The lowest instance of this post puncture headaches is when there is a use of a fine needle, usually between 25 to 27 gauge needles. A 38 millimeter long introducer is usually used if you are using a fine gauge needle, as these needles are thin and flexible, therefore they are difficult to direct accurately. These introducers are often needed for stability during insertion. Before the procedure, a thorough patient explanation of the procedure and hydration are quite vital and positioning is key. Patients may sit or lie laterally, but the maximum lumbar flexion is essential for easy access. In obese patients, a sitting position is preferred and for sedated or uncooperative patients, a lateral position is safer. The spinal anesthesia injection technique can be remembered using the four P's, that is preparation, positioning, projection, and puncture. A trapheus line is usually a horizontal line that connects the highest points of the iliac crest, as this is an important marker to determine the puncture level. In normal adults, the trapheus line passes through the fourth and fifth intervertebral space. In pregnant patients, we are always advised that they should never lie a supine position as the gravid uterus will compress the vena cava and to some lesser extent compresses the outer causing the out of cava compression. This compression could result in hypotension. The pregnant mothers or patients should always lie with the left lateral tilt and before administering the spinal injection, you need to confirm the cerebral spinal flow before injecting. Then a slow injection is performed of the exact dose and you need to withdraw the needle safely. What are the drugs that we use for spinal anesthesia? Local anesthetic agents that are used in spinal anesthesia are either heavier or lighter. Heavier anesthetic agents are known as hyperbaric agents and lighter agents are known as hypobaric agents. Or in some instances, these agents could be having the same gravity as of the cerebral spinal fluid, what we call isobaricity. An hyperbaric solution tends to spread below the level of the injection, while an isobaric solution are not influenced by the level of injection of the drug. Therefore, it's easier to predict the spread of spinal anesthesia when you're using an hyperbaric agent. Isobaric agents or preparations can be made from hyperbaric solutions through an addition of dextrose. Hyperbaric solutions, for example, 0.5% bupivacaine is more predictable and is commonly used. Lidocaine 5% Sometimes it's used, however, it has a shorter duration and has a higher risk of a transient neurologic symptom. And in some cases, adjuvants such as fentanyl, adrenaline, or clonidine may be added to enhance the effect and duration of the spinal anesthesia. The spread of spinal anesthesia depends on several factors, that is, baricity, the position of the patient, the concentration and volume that is injected, the level of injection, and the speed of injection. The specific gravity of the local anesthetic can be altered, as said before, through the addition of a dextrose. A concentration of 7.5% dextrose makes a local anesthetic hyperbaric in nature, or what we call heavy, as compared to the cerebral spinal fluid. This also reduces the rate at which it diffuses and mixes with the cerebral spinal fluid. To assess a block, we use a cold sensation with alcohol or ether, or sometimes we pinch the skin. And a motor block can be checked by asking the patient to lift their legs. And remember, the absence of pain doesn't always mean there's an absence of sensation. 
Some of the common problems and troubleshooting tips that we experience in spinal anesthesia include a no CSF, and in this case, you need to reposition, wait, or aspirate. A scenario of a low or one-sided block may need a patient repositioning or tilting, and a high block can cause respiratory distress or tinkling, and in this case of a high block, you need to act quickly and manage this patient accordingly. A continuous monitoring of patients who are under spinal anesthesia is quite essential for their safety and effectiveness. We perform a continuous electrocardiogram monitoring, blood pressure and oxygen saturation monitoring. Always preload these patients with intravenous fluids and consider supplemental oxygenation when needed. Watch out for hypotension and bradycardia as these are the most common complications. To treat hypotension associated with spinal anesthesia, you elevate the patient's legs, increase the intravenous fluids, and administer vasopressors, for example, ephedrine, metraminol, or phenylephrine. You need to avoid a trendelan spark positioning, especially if you're using hyperbaric solutions, as this can cause an excessive cephalad spread. To treat a total spinal, which is quite a rare but life-threatening emergency, with the signs of a severe hypotension, bradycardia, apnea, and those of consciousness, an immediate action is quite important in trying to save the life of this patient. You intubate the patient, ventilate, give fluids and vasopressors, and your is supposed to sedate once the airway and circulation are stabilized. The possible complications associated with spinal anesthesia include a post puncture headache, a neurological injury, infection if aseptic techniques are not used, urinary retention, nausea and shivering due to excessive loss of heat. A rare but a serious condition that sometimes can occur is an anterior spinal artery syndrome which causes irreversible damage. Some of the special considerations that we need to, we need to put in place in obstetric use of spinal anesthesia are we need to preload with 1.5 liters of crystalloid, a T6 block is required for cesarean sections and the use of a drug volume due to physiological changes in pregnancy. Avoid the spine positioning to prevent any vena cava compression. And uh, with spinal anesthesia, there are some of the benefits that are associated with it, including a reduced aspiration risk and a more alert new unit. And lastly, what are the post-operative care that we're going to give a patient who has received spinal anesthesia? Post-operatively, you need to continue monitoring the blood pressure, the hydration status, the recovery of sensation, and manage the urinary retention together with a post puncture headache and allow amputation of these patients once the block regresses.